John D. Rockefeller, king of Standard Oil. Vilified as a ruthless predator, as evil incarnate, he had created an industrial empire and a personal fortune on a scale the world had never known. In the drama of the Rockefellers, John D. Jr. was cast in an almost impossible role. In his quest for redemption and respectability, John D. Jr. would push his family to the pinnacle of American power. One of his sons would reach for the highest prize, the presidency, and provoke a new generation's rage and hostility. For more than a century, the Rockefellers' wealth and influence have attracted both attention and suspicion, and threatened to tear the family apart. Why do we want to preserve this power? Why do we want to devote our lives to maintaining all these institutions that have been created by the family? Uh, what is the purpose of all of this? John D. Rockefeller, founder of Standard Oil, was the most hated man in America, described as monstrous, evil, cruel. A Baptist preacher once encouraged him to make as much money as he could, then give away as much as he could. It was at this moment, Rockefeller later recalled, that the financial plan of my life was formed. I did not go to any small establishments, he recalled. I was after something big. Only a year later, the something big he was looking for surfaced in the backwoods of Pennsylvania. Oil, to grease the wheels of America's infant industries. Oil, to fuel an explosion of growth. News of the discovery unleashed pandemonium as thousands of speculators descended upon the region. Overnight, wildcatters stripped away whole forests and put up thousands of rickety derricks, hoping to strike black gold. As the oil gushed skyward, fantastic stories appeared of instant fortunes. He was no wildcatter. He saw that drilling for oil was a very risky business. Refining, not drilling, he decided, was where the steady money was to be made. Soon a new rail line linked Cleveland with the oil region. Rockefeller built his refinery right beside it. It was one of the first in the city to produce kerosene a new fuel for lamps that was cheap and clean. The poor man's light, as John D. called it, would bring a brilliant glow into American homes. The soaring demand for it, he was convinced, would make him rich. Obsessed with the business of oil, he mastered every detail, developed new products to sell. By age 25, his refinery was one of the largest in the world. He really mortgaged his life up to the hilt. He borrowed tens of thousands of dollars, which is the equivalent, of course, of millions today. He had the strength of this vision that this was where his destiny was, and this is where the destiny of this country was. The country was going to kind of ride to, to greatness on this tidal wave of oil. And he constantly felt that he would inevitably triumph in some fundamental way. In a move that would transform the American economy, Rockefeller set out to replace a world of independent oil men with a giant company controlled by him. In 1870, begging bankers for more loans, he formed Standard Oil of Ohio. The next year, he quietly put what he called our plan, his campaign to dominate the volatile oil industry, into devastating effect. He entered into a secret alliance with the railroads called the South Improvement Company. In exchange for large, regular shipments, 
Rockefeller and his allies secured transport rates far lower than those of their bewildered competitors. What it really represented was the face of monopoly. The image that was always used was that of the anaconda, the squeezing python-like grips of uh, this economic snake that was just taking individual entrepreneurs and just putting them out of business and reducing them to kind of economic straight where they had no alternative but to really to sell out, to sell out to the principals in this conspiracy. It was a conspiracy, really. It was one of the first great economic conspiracies in this country. His brother and business partner, William, characterized the plan as war or peace, sell out to Standard Oil or suffer the consequences. Rockefeller might create a shortage of the railroad tank cars that transported oil. He might go out and buy up all the barrels on the market, so a competitor would have no place to store his oil or ship it. He would even buy up all the available chemicals that were necessary to refine oil. Rockefeller instructed standard oil men to communicate in code. The company was nicknamed Club. John D. Rockefeller was referred to as Chowder. Many of Rockefeller's targets had no idea that the local refiners who were slashing prices and acting like competitors were actually part of Rockefeller's growing empire. In just two months, he had taken over 22 of the 26 Cleveland refineries, revealing the single-minded drive that would make him both the wonder and the terror of American business. Methodically, secretly, John D. Rockefeller was doing more than transforming a single industry. He was changing forever the way America did business. The day of combination is here to stay, he declared. Individualism has gone, never to return. By 1879, when Rockefeller is 40, he controls 90% of the oil refining in the world. Within a few years, he will control 90% of the marketing of oil and a third of all of the oil wells. So this very young man controls what is not only a national but an international monopoly in a commodity that is about to become the most important strategic commodity in the world economy. In 1883, Rockefeller moved his family to New York, the center of America's burgeoning industrial economy. The king of Standard Oil now set out to transform his company into something bigger and more powerful than anything the world had ever seen. Rockefeller reigned over a patchwork of companies, cumbersome to manage. He was looking for a way to skirt a law that then prohibited combining the operations of businesses in different states. His solution was to have stockholders in 40 companies secretly trade in their shares for certificates in a Standard Oil Trust. The trust became a corporation of corporations. Rockefeller had devised an ingenious legal shield. Behind it, he could command his vast business empire, smoothly and in complete secrecy. In 1885, he moved Standard Oil into an imposing granite fortress near Wall Street. 26 Broadway soon became the world's most famous business address. It was also a hated symbol of a monopoly so powerful that no law seemed able to control it. Rockefeller saw himself as a prophet of a new order. He called it cooperation. His critics called it monopoly. His company would be the world's first great multinational corporation, efficient and stable, with vast economies of scale. Rockefeller had wanted to remain invisible, but he wielded such power that he became a magnet for suspicion. 
Hearings, investigations, and lawsuits began to challenge the Standard Oil Empire. John Dee was called to testify in one forum after another. He was a kind of difficult witness to kind of pin down because on the one hand, he was verbally fairly clever, actually, and keen in, in terms of his ability to kind of listen to the questions. When he was being investigated about the South Improvement Company, for instance, one interrogator said something about the Southern Improvement Company, and he seized upon that misnomer to say, and John D. said, I wasn't part of that. One reporter described 26 Broadway as a cave for pirates a den for the cutthroats of commerce. Half of America seemed willing to lynch Rockefeller. The other half wanted a loan. By 1889, John D. pegged his fortune at more than $40 million. 